Lots of hymns of comfort and encouragement this morning. Second only to the scriptures is the hymns and psalms of the faith uh, that has sustained people through every kind of difficulty and struggle. Uh, the hymns we learn and we memorize them and portions of them come back to us and and they're a great encouragement to our souls. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. As much as I like to go on in my normal path in 2 Samuel, the next chapter was about Absalom and I just couldn't figure out a way to use that for Justin and Heather. So that's a, that's a bad guy, Absalom. But in Hebrews chapter one, it's, it's the great chapter about running the race. And as Justin said, they've, been, they've already been running for a while with this uh, sense of going over to England. And you can pray for them, you can pray for the whole family. Now Justin is half English, his mom's English. So I guess that makes the children like quarter or something, I'm not sure what. And Heather's just all American Georgia. so. You can pray for Justin because as the head of the home, um, he's gonna have various responsibilities in his new job as well as at the church, but also in helping the family get adjusted and you know, being uh, the one who is to be a stabilizing effect in the home because the children will have a whole new experience and Heather will as well. So pray especially for Justin in that fashion. <clears throat> But in Hebrews chapter one, one of the great chapters of the Holy Scriptures, it talks about <clears throat> this patient race. And if you back up just for a minute to Hebrews 10, 10, 36, 10, 35, cast not away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you will receive the promise. So this idea of patience, absolutely necessary in the Christian life. The reason being is because of so many obstacles that we face in the race and in our calling as Christians. There will be ways in which the obtaining of this desire, uh, this promise will seem less than adequate, perhaps even disappointing at times. You have need of patience after you've done God's will. You say, but I've done God's will, and look what happened. Yes, you have need of patience after you've done God's will, and some things come out not the way you think they're supposed to come. So Hebrews 12 and verse one, wherefore seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so, does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We are admonished to never forget the witness that surrounds us. And I want, I want to give you, Justin and Heather, just a few very simple points. We know these things, but as Paul said, I'm not slack to say them again because we all need to hear it again. And it's good for all of us in the congregation, all of these admonitions. We are admonished to not forget the witnesses that surround us. There are many who have trod the path before. There are many who have made the race before. And of course, if you back up to chapter 11, he goes after one person after another after another who ran their race. And their race was very different, but they all ran the race. And so Barnes writes, it cannot be fairly inferred from this that he means to say that all the ancient worthies can actually look upon the conduct of Christians, see their conflicts, he says it's a figurative representation, such as is common meaning that we ought to act as if they were in sight cheering us on. How far the spirits of the just who are departed are permitted to behold what is done is not revealed in the scripture, and it's not. We don't know what they can see, what they can know exactly. But the picture is given to us of the great amphitheater and a race is being run and there are witnesses about and in these particular witnesses, it's like an amphitheater full of people who are runners, who have already run a race before. And that we are to think about them who have run the race before. They may not witness what we do, 
but God witnesses what we do, and they can witness to us of their own race. They can witness to us of the faithfulness of God, how faithful God was to them to help them make the race. They can witness to us about the goodness of the Lord, that even through the midst of great trials, how good God was. They can witness the provision of the Lord, as Jacob did at the end of his life, the God who shepherded me all the days of my life, who fed me, who took care of me all the days of my life. They can witness to the glory of God, especially now that they have finished their race and their internal glory. They knew of the glory of God. They saw some little revelations of the glory of God from time to time while they're here upon the earth. But now we think about them as those who are in the midst of the glory even as we have been studying in the first chapters of Revelation. So you are, you are admonished, Justin and Heather, and all who are present here to not forget the witnesses. Don't forget, you're not the only one running the race. Everybody else around you running the race, and there's already a bunch that have run the race, and God has been faithful to them. Secondly, we're admonished to lay aside weights that slow us down weights that slow us down. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Barnes writes, this weight or burden, runners in the games were careful not to encumber themselves with anything that was heavy. Hence their clothes were so made as not to impede the running. And we've taken that to the nth degree today with our runners and the fabric they use and how many ounces it is, whether it's a swimmer or a runner. But they lay aside the weights so that there's not a hindrance. Barnes says, as applied to Christians, it means we <clears throat> should remove all that would obstruct their progress in the Christian course. Thus, it is fair to apply it to whatever would be an impediment in our efforts to win the crown of life and it's not the same thing in all persons. There's different weights that beset us. He says that easily beset us. So each one of us can personalize this. What is it? What is it? What sin is it in your own life that you have a propensity to? Whether it's anger or whether it's fretfulness and worry or whether it's uh, lust or whether it's uh, whatever it might be. You may apply it to your own self, and God the Holy Spirit, I trust, will apply it to you. You know yourself. You know which sins hinder your Christian walk and would stop you. So you're admonished to lay aside those weights. Whatever it is that keeps you from running the race to the celestial city, because this life is not just about this life. This life is incidental in some ways. It's an, a probation until we reach the heavenly fields. And we have to have that eternal prospect before us. And if we have that eternal prospect before us, then we will think about laying aside whatever sins it is that's hindering the race that we are trying to run for the glory of God. Thirdly, we are admonished to run with patience, he says, to run the race that's set before us with patience. So, you don't run a race with patience if it's a 100-yard dash. You have no patience in that race. You are to run full out. But in this race, so there obviously we know that the Holy Spirit is talking about a marathon. And I don't know how many of you have run a marathon. I have not, not a 26-mile marathon. I've run a 10-mile as a young man, but not a 26. But that takes patience. That takes planning. That takes some thought. That takes some perseverance. That comes with it, the ups and downs of the different miles and what comes to you in those miles. So this is what the Holy Spirit is talking about here. It's a marathon. And what you have is a marathon. What Justin and Heather are looking at is a marathon. As far as we know, if God has called them to that place, they will go to that place and they will live and die in that place and they will be buried in that place, not over here in the States. And so you can pray for them as they begin that part of the marathon race that they've already been running. And all of us need to run with patience. 
Paul says in Romans 2, 7, to those who by patient continuance in well-doing, patient continuance in well-doing, seek for glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. That's the crown that is set before us. But in all things, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 4, in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, afflictions, necessities, distresses. <coughs> patiently, Justin, as Timothy is told, patiently instructing those who oppose themselves. That's the work of the minister. And so as you go to this new place, run with patience. Run with patience. You go into another culture, as I said, even though it's not, it may not be as great a change as some people face in cultures, but it's still a new culture. Actually, I moved from New York State to Alabama. That was a change of culture, actually. And uh, thankfully, I had Brother Ron to help me navigate some of that. I began to read some of the great works of the old Southern gentlemen and Lee and Jackson and different ones. And actually, it was very helpful to me. It was very helpful to me to understand the mindset and the history of a people, because there is a historic memory that a people have that you need to understand. And so Justin's probably already been doing this. I know he's conversant with English history, and it would be good for you and, and Heather as well to read about uh, the great English ministers, missionaries, people, history that will be helpful to you. We are to run with patience. And the idea is, is this endurance, and, and there's also joy to be involved in it. Colossians 1.11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and suffering long and joyfulness. So it's an interesting combination of words when you put together the words patience, suffer long, and joy together. And that is the anomaly of the Christian life, how the Christians can suffer, be long-suffering, they can be patient, and at the same time be filled inwardly with great joy, even when outwardly, perhaps, uh, we face much distress. 1 Corinthians 9, turn there for a moment. That's the other passage when Paul talks about running and fighting. Self-discipline. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, know ye not that they which run in a race all run, but one receives the prize, so run to obtain the prize. Run to obtain the prize. <clears throat> that if nobody else gets the prize, you want the prize. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. He's disciplined. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. We do it to obtain an incorruptible. And talks about the, the vast difference that there is in motive and in reward like the vast difference when we think about the difference between the creator and the creature. What a vast difference that is. But what a vast difference there is between those who discipline themselves carefully, and of course we're in an Olympic year right now, but those who discipline themselves in a crazy way, what a lot of us would think is a crazy way, in order to obtain a gold medal around their neck. And he says, what well, we're gonna receive an incorruptible crown of eternal glory. What a difference, what a contrast. And he says, I therefore run, not uncertainly, we are to study our race, we're not to do it half cocked as they say, or just go off, I'm just gonna do this without any thought put into it. No, much thought has to be put into it, even as those who are Olympians from of old put much thought into what they were gonna do. He says, not as uncertainly to fight not as one who beats the air, but I keep under my body, I discipline myself, I bring it into subjection, lest at any means when I have preached to others, I myself would be a castaway. So there's discipline involved, the discipline of thought, the discipline of life, in order to reach the goals if we're going to run. Now, back to Hebrews. He says, not only is there uh, this idea that we're running uh, and we're admonished to remember the witnesses, to lay aside the weights that so easily beset us, and, uh, and to do it patiently. But, he, but also, 
We're admonished to look to Jesus Christ. Look at verse two. Looking unto Jesus, the author, he calls us the author of our faith because faith is described in the scriptures as the gift of God. So he's the author of it. Faith does not come out of our fallen nature. There must be life from God for us in order to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There must, he must come to us first. He is the author and the finisher, even as Paul says to the Philippians, uh, that he will complete that which he began in you. So he's the author in that he's the first mover. He came to us, granted us faith to believe in him. He also sustains us. He perseveres with us in all of our problems in order that we might persevere in the faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne on God. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you get weary and faint in your own minds. You've not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So fourthly, we're admonished to look to Jesus Christ. Why? Because he began his own race in obedience to his father, and he finished the race. And he finished the race. We've already talked about looking at the saints of old, this great cloud of witnesses who are very encouraging to us. They've run their own race. God preserved them. But now we come to the paradigm, the one example that we always look to above every other example. It's the race that Jesus Christ ran. He who was in eternal glory and he came down to this earth to tabernacle among us and to run this race among us in the midst of all kinds of contradictions and that he made it to the end successfully. He says, for the joy that was set before him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy? What was that? What was the joy that was set before Jesus Christ? In Isaiah 53, the great chapter about Messiah, he writes in verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, the father bruised the son, put him to grief, when you shall make his soul an offering for sin, this propitiation, this redemption. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he will see his seed. He will see his seed. He saw his people. As he was pouring out his life, he saw his people. That was his joy. His joy was that the Father had given him a people and that he was dying for that people and that he would successfully redeem that people and redeem the earth itself and place upon the earth and the new heavens and the new earth a redeemed people, a redeemed nation, the people of God. What was the joy that was set before him? The joy set before him was a humanity worshiping at the throne of God because he loves his Father because he wants to do whatever his father tells him to do, and he wants to fulfill the purpose of his father, and he does fulfill the purpose of his father. So that in 1 Corinthians 15, the great chapter on the resurrection, what do we read about this work of Christ that was vindicated, obviously, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? But how does it all end out? Well, it ends out in chapter 15, beginning in verse 24. Then comes the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, that is all evil power and authority, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that's going to be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet, but when he says all things, it's manifest that he, God the Father, is accepted, which put all things under him, and when everything is subdued unto Christ, then the Son himself will be subject to him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So he gives the kingdom to the Father. He delivers the kingdom to the Father. That God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the great Trinity, may be all in all. That was the joy set before him. A redeemed humanity, a redeemed humanity who are worshiping at the throne of God as he was originally created to do. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And the Greek word is he stayed under the cross. He stayed under the cross. This is his race. This is why we look to him for his race. His race was to stay under the cross. 
that which Satan wanted him to come out from under in the first temptations when he won against Satan in the wilderness. But throughout his life and Peter, when Peter said, when Christ said, I'm going to the cross and this is what they're going to do and they're going to kill me. And Peter said, no, this will never be. Don't do it, Lord. And he looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You don't savor the things that are of God. Because this was the joy that was set before him, that he would fulfill his father's will. And that was to stay under the cross, to stay under the cross. He says, enduring the cross and despising the shame. I'm not sure how it's done in the new translations, but despising the shame. Or in other words, thinking little of the shame. He thought little of that. He despised it. If you despise something, you think little of it. He thought little of the shame. Oh yeah, I got shame, so what? I am fulfilling the purposes of my Father. And that's how we are to be in our race as well. We are to stay under the cross. We are to stay under our identification with Jesus Christ. And we are to despise the shame. Think little of what the world thinks of us. And then he says, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him. The Greek word is analyze, analyze, consider him, analyze the fact of Christ remaining under this contradiction of sinners while he was here. Consider him, analyze this. Think about how he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest you get tired out and worn out. So in your Christian walk and witness and you get contradicted by the world and the world doesn't like it and the world frowns or the world may even do more than frown, he says, think about, analyze how much this one who is holy and pure and never committed a sin against anyone in the world, what kind of contradiction of sinners he had against himself, lest you get tired out and wearied with your ministry, that ministry that God has given to you to be a light in this world. So when you're tired of the race, and when you're tired of ministering to an ungrateful world, and when you get tired maybe of even ministering and working in the assembly of the saints who also have sin in them, remember your Lord's example, that it is greater than any other example you can remember or analyze. His cross was greater than any cross that he gives to men. His contradiction was greater than any contradiction he will put you in. His weariness was greater than any weariness you will feel. His sweating great drops of blood through the strain of his work is greater than any shall ever feel as far as stress and strain. And we can feel great stress and we can feel great strain and it can bring men to great distresses. But we have a savior to look to, that he is not inconsiderate of these things. He knows, he knows, and he will sustain. Verse five, we are also admonished to not despise God's chastening. You have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as children, as, as his dear children. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. So first of all, we see it's the Lord's chastening. He does these things. And, and it's, again, this word paideia from the Greek, it's, <coughs> it's the whole education. It's your whole education. When we think of chastening, we just think about getting the spoon put to our behinds or the switch. There's two words used in here. One of them has to do with the pedia of God, which is the whole education of God in which he uses everything to educate us. There's another one that means the, the rod, and then you get whooped in here also. But it's the Lord who is doing this chastening, this educating us. Nor faint when you're rebuked of him for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So not only is it the Lord chastening, but it's, he's chastening you because he loves you. And he scourges every son he receives. He's ch it's the Lord's chasing you. It's chasing you because he loves you. And it's chasing you because you have been received as a son into his family. And it's a chastening, which at the end of verse 9 is that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's the purpose of the chastening, to be a, part, be a partaker of his holiness, to make you holy. Why do we need to be chastened? We need to be chastened, and we need to chasten our own children 
because our natures are such that they are strong in rebellion. <laughs> they're strong in sin, they're strong in pride, they're strong against the Lord at times, even his own children, we know that. We know that from our own lives, we know that from the lives of the, the, the scriptures are not pretending about the saints of old, they show the good, the bad, and the ugly in them. And so chastening or this whole education of the Lord is the Lord is educating his dear children to bring them and prepare them for the, for the celestial city so that the Puritans and others have written through the years understanding this chastening using of various things um, that it's of the Lord, that God is doing this thing to prepare you and to make something useful of you in his own kingdom. The chastening under the minister's preaching, when we're sitting under other ministers, when I'm sitting under other ministers and I enjoy being able to do that, when you're sitting under the minister and he's preaching the word of God and there is an education going on there, we are to receive it as from the Lord. Chastening under the congregation's exhortations. As ministers of Christ, we are exhorted by our congregation and the congregation exhorts one another. We are to understand that as the love from God and as from the Lord. Chastening under sickness and weakness of body when we feel badly and we feel sick and we're we're down. We need to understand that, that that comes from the Lord. We're not of those who say that God has promised you health, wealth, and welfare. He hasn't promised you health necessarily. It may be that you need sickness in order to be better educated for the kingdom. We know, at least I know, that when I'm sick, I get better with the Lord. <laughs> Actually, I'm better when I'm sick. It knocks my pride down. It reminds me of my mortality. It teaches me to look to God. It realize, I realize that one little tiny microscopic organ can stop me from doing everything I've ever done in my life. And I have known that with, I knew a dear brother who was, a, he was an engineer, uh, electrical engineer. He put together, he was the head man putting together the Dow Corporation in, in Kentucky. And he got, he got bit by a little tick and he could get to the point in which he didn't know how to change out a plug in his house. So just to say, God humbles us with these things. And there must be a reason for that. It must be because we need humbling. Chastening under ministry distresses, and I can say that to Justin and other ministers here as well, that there will be ministry distresses. And it's chastening. It's a chastening from the Lord to make something out of us. It's a chastening under frustrating, even maddening circumstances. And we're experiencing some, and we have experienced some in the last two years, and we may experience some more. And if socialism comes, you will experience frustrating, maddening circumstances for a people who are not used to those things. And we must see it. While we understand the source of some of these things, and we can preach against it, and we can say it would be better if we did this, Ultimately, it's the hand of God, and we can survive it. We can actually thrive in it, actually, if we will use it aright and see it as the whole education of God. So, cheer up. Don't be discouraged, he says. Verse 11, no chastening seems joyous, but grievous. No, these chastenings, I'm not, I'm not here, I'm not a Pollyanna, I'm not here to tell you that it's not hard and it's not difficult and it's not frustrating and it's not maddening. It's all of those things. But he says, nevertheless, it doesn't seem happy. It seems grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them that are exercised thereby. Cheer up, he says. This is your education. It's going to bring forth good fruit, the fruit of God's working in your soul. Lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame is turned out of the way. Rather, let it be healed. Don't live discouraged. Know that his chastening, your troubles are working out for your good. Doddridge writes, it is true that all chastening for the present seems not to be a matter of joy, but grief. It is painful to the flesh and to the human nature, 
which would rather be excused from it. Thank you, Lord, but I will just be excused from that part of the education. But afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are in a suitable manner exercised therewith. It produces and improves virtues which afford peace and joy to your mind and like a nobler crown than that which many endure to obtain richly rewards the most strenuous labor and the most afflictive struggle. If we can possibly, if we can possibly come to the place in which we accept the things that happen to us and what our lives are and who we are and the way God made us and all those things. When it's possible, even in those brief moments of time for some of us, to come to a sweet submission to those things. Yes. Everything's okay. Everything's really okay. And it's not just a dream and it's not just a Pollyanna. It's okay. Because God is doing those things. And what a sweetness there is if ever we can train these wild hearts of ours down to believe that. Therefore, Dodgers says, rally your languid spirits, lift up the hands that hang down, that they may exert themselves in a glorious combat. Strengthen the feeble, tottering knees that they may hold out to the end of this important race. And by the proper exercise of discipline in your Christian societies, and by all the other offices of true and faithful friendship, make straight paths for your feet. Regulate matters so that the way of duty may be as obvious and as easy as possible, that the infirm, the lame, the decrepit may not, by discouragements and temptations, be turned out of the way or thrown down, but that every such feeble traveler in the way to Zion may be healed, recovered from falls or weaknesses, and strengthened to a course of strenuous, persevering piety. And then he concludes in verse 14, where he talks about following peace and holiness. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. This is a great exhortation and a good exhortation for Heather and Justin as well. Why do we need to be at peace with all men? Why do we wish to be at peace with all men? Paul, Paul says in, in Romans that we are to be at peace with all men as much as lies within us, our part, our part. Some men, some men are not gonna have peace, but our part. We can be at peace. Why? Why do we need to be at peace with men? Because we wish to teach men. We wish to influence men. We wish to be an example to men. And you can't do that if you're mad as a hat at them. Not possible. And they know it and you know it. Follow peace with all men. You know, our business on this earth, there, there are many maddening things and things that are happening to us right now. But our business on this earth is to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ and to reach that celestial city and every possible person that we meet up with to follow peace with them. You know, it's not my business to change men. That's God's business. Okay? It's not your business. Sometimes your frustration comes from really a good motive. You want them to change and they're not changing. And it frustrates you to no end. But when you can learn that you're not God, that relieves some of the pressure, okay? You follow peace with all men, as much as lies within you, because it's our business to teach them about the Prince of Peace and to show them the glory of the Prince of Peace and to lead them, and you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink the same way with men. But we follow peace with men. Otherwise, our lives are just going to be filled with a total frustration, frustrated with everybody all the time. And you can, you can look on social media accounts and find the angry people. The, the potato head's got his angry eyes on, as it says in the little kids' video. Make sure you take your angry eyes with him. You might need those. No, 
Be at peace with all men. Do not indulge in the passion of anger, irritation of spirit, follow after peace and holiness, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. It's a following after holiness. It's a following after being set apart unto God. It's a following after being devoted to Jesus Christ. It's a following after being consecrated. I consecrate myself to you, O God. Being set apart to him alone, seeking his smile alone. It's, it's you I want to please. That's why I read, I read out of uh, Tozer's book on worship. Now, I don't agree with everything about Tozer, but I sure agree about his love for God is consecration to God. There are people that are full Arminians that I wouldn't agree with on a bunch of that stuff, but they are devoted to Jesus Christ. I think about John Wesley. Some people have asked me at times, um, do you think John Wesley made it to heaven? I think, well, if he didn't, I sure ain't. And that's what Whitfield said too. I won't see him in heaven because he's gonna be so close to the throne, I won't, even, I won't even see him. And he was serious about that because of the zeal and the love and the consecration that that man had for Jesus Christ. He was fearless, not because it was just in him, but because he loved the Lord. Follow peace, follow holiness. And, and he finishes this out by talking about not failing the grace of God. He writes in uh, 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and many be defiled, lest there be a fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You know afterwards he would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected, and he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Follow a holy life. Follow after a holy life. Esau grew up in a, in a God-fearing family. Esau was around, you know, we think about Esau and we think bad because we know the outcome of his life. He was under the patriarch Isaac, who loved God, who worshiped God. Esau was a partaker of times of worship. Esau was circumcised. Esau had all the outward benefits of true religion and yet he failed of the grace of God. Esau threw off his birthright. Esau did not finish the race. Esau chose a different path, a path of unbelief. He sat in the seat of the scorner. What good is my religion, religion gonna do me? Give me something to eat. And so he threw off eternity for the temporal. And he failed of the grace of God because the grace of God was all around him and had surrounded him in the goodness of God and he threw it off. And so we are admonished, run the race and be patient in the running. Remember the witnesses all around us. Remember the great witness, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the witness of all witnesses and who ran the race of all races and who has not given you a race to run that's harder than his. Your race is not as hard as his. And your race is sustained by his race that he won. And don't fail the grace of God. But look to Christ, who is better than the angels, Hebrews 1.4. His priesthood is better than the priesthood of the Levites. It's a special priesthood like the priest of Melchizedek. He has a better covenant, better promises, the law of faith in Christ better sacrifices than the ones before, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You have in yourselves and in heaven a better and an enduring substance, better goods. Lay up the treasures in heaven. A better country, a better king, a better inheritance, a fixed righteousness, a better resurrection, a resurrection to life and not death. So don't forget the witnesses who have gone before you, Justin and Heather. Lay aside whatever sin that might slow down your race. Run with patience. You've had to have patience already, continue to have patience. Look to Jesus' race for ultimate encouragement and never despise God's chastening in your race. It's, it's necessary. Follow peace and holiness in your race. 
Don't be like Esau, who failed the grace of God. Good admonitions. The writer of the Hebrews to us this morning. Let's conclude together with a hymn.